let's talk about the sun. Chapter 8. First, some basics. Um, the sun is the only star that we can study up close. It's the only one we can travel to. So a lot of our knowledge of stars, which we'll get to uh, later this quarter, comes from our very own sun. Now, it turns out that we have a very average star in many, many ways in terms of brightness and size and temperature and things like that. So I guess that's good if you're only going to have one star that you can study up close. At least it's kind of a pretty typical star. Um, and again, our, our next closest neighbor, Alpha Centauri, with our current technology, it would take us uh, you know, tens of thousands of years to travel there. Uh, so we are stuck in our little solar system here. Um, but let's talk about what we do know about uh, our sun. So we're going to start here with some just some basic, basic properties. Uh, what is a star, by the way? I mean, we kind of have a, a, a debate uh, sometimes about what a planet is and whether Pluto, for example, is, is a, it should be considered a full-fledged planet or not. But there's not a whole lot of question between a star and a planet. The key word there, if you ask me anyway, is fusion. If there's fusion in the core, you have yourself a star. Because stars and planets can be made of the same stuff, namely hydrogen and helium. Um, but a star has fusion in its core. And we'll talk about that more later on. Now, fusion, it has so much fusion, there's so much energy released that this is like, you know, a billion nuclear bombs going off at once. So why doesn't the star just blow up at that point? Well, <clears throat> The star also has a tremendous other force called gravity. So gravity is trying to crush the star, fusion is trying to blow it apart, and the two things have this remarkable balance, at least they do with our home star, which is a good, good thing, and we call that hydrostatic equilibrium, that balance between gravity trying to crush it and fusion, the energy from fusion trying to blow it up. Um, hydrostatic equilibrium, our sun is amazingly balanced in that regard, and if it wasn't, um, well, we wouldn't be here talking about it. We couldn't have survived. Life would have, couldn't have evolved or wouldn't have evolved the same way for sure. All right, some basic stats. Looking in the sky, we see the sun is half a degree wide in our sky. That's about like your thumb at arm's length, about only half a degree. Based on the distance to the sun, then we can calculate uh, that it's about 110 Earths wide, 110 Earths in diameter, which is just incredible. It's crazy. Um, I forget the exact number, but you know, if an airplane tried to fly around the sun, I mean, it would take something like a year or something ridiculous to fly just around the sun. It's so huge. But me talking about it and you seeing it uh, is a different thing. So this is one of those times a picture is really needed. So let's take a look at our sun compared to the planets that we've been discussing here um, lately. There it is. Yeah, that little, let's find, oh, there's Earth. Little tiny dot there. So 110 of those across whew, would equal the sun. Amazing. Mighty Jupiter. I made a big deal about Jupiter being so huge. And look at that. Look at that. Not even close. Another great uh, model here of what they would look like. I love this one. Really beautiful. Now, that's in terms of diameter. Now, we know if we assume the sun is a, is a perfect sphere, uh, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So if you take that 110 and cube it, it gives you an idea of how many Earths would fit inside the sun. And it's a pretty crazy number. 100 cubed is a million. So yes, over a million Earths would fit inside our sun just mind-boggling. So, what about the weight of the sun, the mass of it? Now, we can get that based on how fast the planets orbit around the sun. We can pretty easily calculate its mass, and we come up with 332,000 times the mass of Earth. So, if you had a, a scale, and you put the sun on one side, you have to put 332,000 Earths on the other side to balance it. Just mind-boggling. So, it has this mind-boggling size, mind-boggling mass. Here's the question. Is it dense? Is it dense? Well, the correct answer is no, it's not dense. Despite being that heavy, that much mass, remember, it's still made of hydrogen and helium. And so, therefore, the overall density is not that great. Now, it is actually dense, very dense in the core, uh, but the vast majority of it is not dense, and it balances out to be about the same as, shockingly, 
the gas giants, such as Jupiter. That's about the same density as Jupiter, for example, or Neptune. So there you go. Should make sense. They're made of the same stuff. All right. Does the sun rotate? Yes, it does. Galileo Galilei was the first one to notice that. He followed the sunspots around until they came back around again and saw that the sun takes about a month to rotate. It is a differential rotation, and just like the gas giants, it rotates fastest at its equator and slower at the pole. So about 25 days around, if there's a sunspot at its equator, it would take about 25 days to go around a little slower as you go up or down in the latitude there. And then finally very important, the temperature. Now usually when we describe the temperature of a star, we refer to its surface temperature, not its core temperature. Those are wildly different. Uh, the surface temperature of the sun, 5800 Kelvin. I believe that's about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 to 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so obviously super hot, not crazy hot, nothing we can't easily you know, reproduce in a lab. That's only for the surface, though. We obtain that from something called a black body curve, which we'll get to uh, in the next chapter, what that means. All right, so here's a picture that was taken in my class, uh, looks like in uh, 2014 or so, back when the sun was particularly active, and you see lots of dark spots there. And, uh, oh, this was supposed to be a kind of, it kind of rotates a little bit. We sometimes try to come up with a, a GIF to, to show the sun's rotation, show how the sunspots move. All right, the sun's just slightly important when it comes to energy, right? That's uh, where uh, pretty much all of our energy comes from, either directly or, or indirectly. Obviously, we can get solar energy directly, but also things like fossil fuels. Uh, in the end, they came from the sun because the sun is what made the plants grow and the animals ate the plants and the plants and the animals died and were compressed and became you know coal and oil and stuff like that so it all eventually pretty much goes back to the sun um, except i guess for nuclear energy things like that but anyway what's really important is how much energy we can use and uh, especially for things like you know solar panels and so forth and that's called the solar constant uh, that is per square meter uh, comes out to be about 1,400 watts per square meter at the top of our atmosphere. So, for example, that's what the space station can, can uh, use with their solar panels to run that. We only get about half that much on the surface. Thanks to our atmosphere, that's going to block about half of the energy. So now we're looking at about, you know, for a square meter panel, you could theoretically get, you know, light up 700 watt light bulbs with that, but that's only theoretical because nothing's 100% efficient. So you're not going to even get, uh, you're not even going to get that much out of it. Um, so that's why you need really large areas for solar energy. But guess what? We have really large areas we can use for solar energy. There are the panels I mentioned on the space station, how it gets its energy. Those panels are about the length of a football field altogether. So. It had to be pretty big to supply the power necessary. This is the largest solar uh, plant here in Florida. This is near Arcadia, Florida, and I got to visit and get a special tour there and see what that was like. So that was uh, very, very interesting. You can see there on the bottom right here where I crawled up under one and took this picture. Peak power, uh, only about 300 watts for one of those large uh, panels. So they need a really big field uh, in order to get the power just to... to you know, light up the town of Arcadia, actually. But um, anyway, it's it's clean energy. This is the kind of area you need if you want a lot of power. This is one of the largest ones, if not the largest one in the world in Morocco, as you can see. What a perfect place. That's what you really want. You want a desert and uh, where you're just not going to have any clouds. And unlike here in Florida, you're not going to have hurricanes and things like that that can also mess up your panels. But um, so the American Southwest, for example, is really a great place for solar power. And there are two different types of solar plants, by the way. I think that one, yeah, that one's actually not the PV, uh, like the photovoltaic cells. It's not the PV. This one is one where it's actually heating up a fluid with a curved mirror. So that's a different type, still solar. Okay, luminosity of the sun is, by definition, all the energy it releases in all directions. But, frankly, we're going to use the term luminosity as simply brightness. So when we talk about the luminosity of stars, we're just talking about their brightness. 
Uh, theoretically, this would be all the energy if you had a, the sun in a big glass bowl and you captured all of the energy it released in every direction. Yeah, four times 10 to the 26 watts. That's just a number you cannot even fathom. But let's put it this way. If you took a giant concave mirror and focused all of the light energy of the sun towards the earth, if you thought, hey, great, you know, we'll get lots and lots of energy from the sun. Uh, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Because remember, we only get one tiny little sliver of the sun's energy that hits the earth. Our little speck of dust 93 million miles away. If you focus all that energy towards us, you're looking at the energy equivalent of 100 billion nuclear bombs, which would evaporate all of our oceans in six seconds. So probably not a good idea to focus all of the sun's energy on the earth at once. All right. I'm going to keep it short and sweet here for the first part here of chapter eight. Thanks for listening.